Then join hand in hand, brave Americans all, by uniting we stand, by dividing we fall, in so righteous a cause, let us hope to succeed, for heaven approves of each generous deed. In freedom we're born, and in freedom we we'll live, our persons are ready. Hello everyone, my name is Doug Ulwick. I'm president of the Historical Society of Old Abington. And I'm here with you today in Cable Land to do a presentation of show and tell from some, in, from some new acquisitions to our collection. Um, it being one of our regular programs, in spite of the fact the only people here today are myself and cameraman Paul Watson, um, we're still gonna open with a salute to the flag as is our tradition. And you may join me at home if you'd like. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So as I said, today is one of our regular programs. We do six a year, typically calling them conversations. It's a conversation of one today, which is a little different. Also, we're handling the images and the graphics a bit different today in that this is difficult stuff to just hold up and show you on a camera. So I've supplied Paul with scans of everything that I'm showing. So he'll intersperse me with, with the images that I provided him with so you'll get a better chance to see what they really look like. And I think that should be a little more effective than trying to focus on the small items we have to show. So it's, it's a different program for us to do. I'm hoping we can do one every year. Uh, speaking of what we do every year, uh, we do three programs typically in our fall semester, as we call it. Um, September, I'm sorry, October, November, December. Then we take a break for the winter and come back in March, April, and May. And this is our May taping today. Um, and you can find all of our all of our programs on YouTube and also um, they're broadcast on local cable as well. So you have several places to find us. I've long wanted to do a, a program telling you folks what's here in this building. And there's a lot of stuff here in this building and it's really impossible just to share all of it with you. But I thought giving you a taste of some of the stuff that comes in our door and how it comes in our door and the forms it comes in with will give you a better sense of what sort of things are in the building and also how we acquire uh, items for the collection and what sort of items we acquire because it's changed. It's changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, typically, people donate stuff to us. They might be closing down a house, settling an estate, um, realize they're sitting on something that maybe should be shared, that isn't shared, that's in their personal collection. And some of that has happened. Uh, but I'd like to start actually with something that didn't quite happen that way. Uh, someone who used to live in Rockland had moved to New Hampshire and had been a collector of, of some local memorabilia. And I ended up getting an email one day saying, hey, uh, we've got these pieces. Would you like to buy them? Well, no, <laughs> first of all, I didn't need them. But I thought they'd be valuable additions to the Historical Society collection. Uh, we also don't have an acquisition budget. We're not rich. Uh, so I, try, I decided to go, go to the media and see what I could do and went to the Abington Facebook page and posted pictures of the items and said, hey, would anyone like to sponsor the purchase of this as a donation to the Historical Society of Old Abington? And I, I think it was 10 minutes and I had two offers come in. And the first one that came in, I, I, I took and thanked very much, but it had me kind of scratching my, my very bald head because the offer came in from Chicago. But, okay, what, what, there's a story there somewhere. And I reached out to the, the donor and said, I hate to look a gift horse in the mouth, but why are you paying for this from Chicago? Well, let me talk about what the pieces were first because then it becomes a little more apparent. Um, they were two pieces of commemorative china that were made for the town of, old town of Abington's um, bicentennial in 1912. 
and they were put out by local merchants. And they are actually physically here to my left. Um, this is a piece of, I believe we call it transfer wear. And it's, a, a, I'm sorry, it looks gaudy to me. Maybe that was the style in 1912, but these are in green and pink and blue. Uh, but this is an image um, taken from the arch at Island Grove back across the bridge. Um, and, and it always seems silly to me because why weren't they photographing the arch? Well, when they were making the china, the bridge was done and the arch wasn't. So that's what, all they had to photograph. Uh, but, and, and that's what they photographed and put it on the china. And then the other piece is um, what we would call the Legion building. And it's on a, a creamer, a pitcher, small pitcher. Um, it was built as a high school, one of our first dedicated high school buildings in town, and I believe that's what it's so labeled. Uh, you can still recognize the building from the image. Uh, but anyway, so again, now why Chicago? And the gentleman got back to me and um, said, and by the way, it's uh, Miguel Calderon. And Miguel got back to me and said, I grew up in Abington. I came to Chicago for school and I stayed. but." my mother would take us to the bridge at Island Grove as part of our out and about town to watch people fish, to you know, hang out at Island Grove. So I want to donate them in her memory. Sweet story, it really was. So that's how we acquired them. They were delivered to me directly from New Hampshire and, and I handed over a check and they are now part of our collection. So uh, uh, I love it when things happen like that. It's not unusual particularly in this day and age, to have stuff come from us to long distance. But the New Hampshire, Chicago, Abington connection, that was a first. That really was. Um, so that was that, those pieces that I wanted to share with you today. The next, thing, next topic I want to talk about is, again, a little unusual, in that the piece that, that we're discussing, we don't own. It hasn't been given to us. I think someday it will be, I really do. Um, the piece is a high boy, a piece of furniture, a dresser you might call it, that belonged to the first minister in Abington, Sam Brown. And he started um, before the town was formed. We, need, we needed to have a minister before we could have a town. It was just the rules and regs back then when we were still a British subject. Um, anyway, but Sam Brown was from Newbury, Mass, and was educated at, at Harvard. They said back in the day at Cambridge, but it meant Harvard. Um, and he came to town as our first minister. Well, he had furniture, no surprise. He also had a journal that is rather famous. Um, it is currently in the collection of the Congregational Library in Boston. For years, it was at the First Congregational Church where he served, and later United Church of Christ. It was here, actually, in the Dyer and the, the um, Historical Society collection. Uh, we didn't own it. It was on loan. Our insurance people were nervous. We returned it. But we transcribed it, too. Um, but the Congregational Library of Boston was very interested in it. Again, maybe separate story. Um, there are four, I think, known chairs of his. Um, one is at United Church of Christ. One is here um, that came to us because the, the library in Boston had it and said, this isn't really our mission to collect furniture. You want it? And we said, sure, it's an ugly chair. I'm sorry, it really is, but, but it was Sam Brown's, and we now have it in our collection. Strangely, there's another one in a museum in New York. Um, I don't think it's MoMA, I forget which one. But if you go online, you can find Sam Brown's chair in New York. But this piece is Sam Brown's high boy, and it has been passed down through the families forever. Um, and I've known about it for some time, and I know who has it, and there was talk about giving it to us, uh, and that hasn't happened. And I asked about it again recently, not to be pushy, just what's going on. Um, and it was clear it wasn't coming to us quickly, but I turned to the owner and said, let's handle this differently. Do me a favor. Take some pictures of it. You know, that way, although we don't have it in our collection, we have a record of it in our collection, we have photographs of it in our collection, and we know where it is. So it was kind of a treasure trove. Not only did she take pictures of it, and, and Paul will be able to put the pictures in, in the sequence here, but there's a head-on picture of the two pieces, the upper and the lower, which 
they're two separate pieces of furniture, actually, the high boy and the low boy combined. Um, and uh, anyway, and then there's like a hidden drawer at the top, and the, the other, the next image shows that that ajar a little bit. It's just kind of built into the moldings of the top of it. And I guess you could keep valuables and secrets there, and supposedly no one would know where they were. Um, being a piece that's from the early 1700s, there's some damage. And uh, the third image we have shows a crack along the bottom of one of the drawers. No big deal. So all of that was fine and wonderful. And you know we should get dimensions, I suppose, and a little more about the piece. But what I didn't expect is that they also supplied me with a photograph of a couple of pages of a notebook where the current owner's mother um, had written the story of it. And I, I've transcribed it and added a little more background to it, but I'm just going to quickly read it. The family high boy, the legend of this treasure was told to me many times over the years by my grandmother, Carrie C. Nash Richmond. It belonged to the first minister of our church in Abington, and I added parenthetically the note, the first congregational church in Abington, later the United Church of Christ in Abington. Um, he came here in 1712. He came here in 1711. <laughs> Note the top drawer, called the secret drawer. The split at the bottom drawer has been there in my entire memory of the piece. The top and the bottom were separated, the top piece being kept in my Aunt Sarah's closet, and the bottom piece was used in her bedroom as a bureau at my parents' home at 30 Thaxter Avenue in Abington. Grandpa also kept horse collars and old stuff in the top piece at one time, long before my memory. Rodents must have lived in it at one time, which accounts for the damaged drawers in the bottom piece. Um, it's had a colorful history. And, and also, I've been told by the family that they, they had it appraised. They wanted to know. And, and the auction type people weren't terribly impressed because the top and the bottom don't match. Um, they wouldn't have matched. They would have been constructed, purchased, whatever, acquired separately, uh, and one put on top of the other. They, they go together, but they don't match. So in terms of antique value, that, that hurt the antique value, but we don't care. So hopefully someday that piece will come to our collection. For the moment, we know where it is. It's safe and sound. It's being used. It's being treasured by the family that has owned it since Sam Brown. Now the next collection actually I'd like to talk about came to us from John Burroughs. John had a business in Rockland. Um, I assume the business is going to survive, but he's moving from Rockland. He's moving to Minnesota, I believe, back, back to his home turf. But for many, many years, he was uh, on Union Street, right near the Catholic Church, number 393. And the house, now that he's finally cleaned it out and shipped most of it out west, uh, is now currently on the market. It was a pool residence, historically, and quite historic. Uh, but he had an interest in local history. He was very active in Channing Church on Webster Street. Um, his partner actually created uh, the telephone museum in the sandpaper factory some of you might be familiar with. But uh, a lot of what he had amassed, he said, there's, there's no reason to take this west with me. It's, it's Rockland history, or in some cases, Abington history. So uh, gradually, he's been turning, he had been turning stuff over to us. And, and we have quite an inventory of, of stuff from his personal collection. Um, the biggest piece, and it's here to my right, uh, is, is a copy of the 1903 Atlas of Surveys of Plymouth County. Um, and for some reason, the town of Cohasset, Norfolk County, and, and Paul has a slide of the front cover verbiage to include. Uh, a copy of this has existed here at the Dyer Memorial Library and Archives since 1972. It had been donated. This one's been donated to the Historical Society. Our collections sometimes overlap. It's not a bad thing to have two of this. And this might be more complete in that there were some inserts in it which are still here, which I'm not clear if they're in the 1972 donation that the Dyer had acquired. And one of the things, because it's not bound in, is this highway map of Plymouth County, uh, also from 1903. And it's curious, I, I, I've reproduced part of it uh, in slide form 
uh, the Abington Whitman Rockland part of it. Um, and I, I'm not sure of the key as to some of the symbols they used here. I think some of the uh, trolley lines are highlighted, and they certainly show railroad lines as well. But uh, if you want to know where the roads were in 1903, this map will tell you. Uh, it's not the only thing it tells you. Uh, the other one that's in here, and it's actually bound in, is the uh, railroad map, the new railroad and reference map of the state, uh, also from 1903. Uh, this one begins, begins to be relevant because questions have come up somewhat recently. And there's a slide in here where I, I reproduce part of it. Oh, and I love the fact that you know they didn't get things perfect right no matter what. Um, the town of Pembroke, as if, as if your pen broke, uh, instead of Pembroke, uh, right here. You'll see it on the slide. It's kind of right in the middle. But what shows on here uh, is the line, the Hanover branch line, kind of at the middle of the screen. You'll see North Abington, Rockland, West Hanover. The Hanover branch railroad is long gone, but it became the rail trail that starts in Abington on Monroe Street. And we're kind of working on a, a turntable park to kick it off, to begin it on, on uh, uh, Monroe Street in Abington. Uh, currently, it stops in, on the Hanover line. But I just read as recently as, I think, last week, uh, Hanover is very active in trying to do what Abington and Rockland did, and that's open up their section of it. It'll open up in sections, the first one going to like the West Hanover Post Office. That's the first branch they'll open. Um, the trick for them is parts of the right of way were sold off, which I can't imagine how it happened, but it did. And to reacquire those to make the trail contiguous has been their challenge. Uh, the rail trail became very popular in the past year as people were dealing with the COVID-19 um, uh, illness. Uh, they wanted to get out and walk and do something and at the same time stay socially distant. Just get out and get some exercise. And the rail trail was, was very, very popular to do that. So it's, it's known pretty well. The other thing that's on here and it's less known is from Whitman, there was a branch line that went over into Bridgewater and through that connected into the Brockton lines. Someone had a, a copy of a rail ticket from uh, uh, Brockton to Abington or something. And so how is that possible? And that's how it was possible. And uh, so to see that, that, he, that connection here. And another question that came up not long ago uh, had to do with, on that line, the Washington Street Station. There was, in, in, there was a train station on Washington Street for that line. And the next slide actually is an enlargement from the town of Whitman map in this book. And it shows the Washington Street Station. And the other curious aspect of it, the railroad went under the road. I don't know what digging they had to do to do that, but it was right south of Commercial Street. The road, the railroad bed is still visible, but it's, it's long gone. But you can see it on this particular plant. And I love the fact that it's detailed enough that right next to the Washington Street station, the railroad goes under Washington Street. Kind of a rare thing. But you can study these and just learn so much about it. The next slide is from the, the town of Rockland map. I think if I have my, my maps in sequence. Uh, no, I'm sorry, still in Whitman. It's still in Whitman. Um, and you'll see labeled here Brigham Pond. Brigham Pond doesn't exist anymore. It did in 1903. It was another mill pond. And it was bounded by, on the north, um, uh, Route 58 um, on the south, South Ave. And to one side, it backed up to the properties on Pleasant Street. Um, but there were manufacturing plants on South Ave that drew water power from this pond. And also noted on this plan, I love the accuracy, there was a canal that connected it over onto Hobart, Hobart's Pond, I believe it is. And it shows dotted lines for the canal that connected the two ponds. If, apparently, if one ran low, and I'm thinking Brigham's ran low a lot, uh, they were able to bring water in from the other pond. Uh, a lot of manufacturing went on in that part of town that's long gone, but it contributed to making South Abington, Whitman, what it is today. So to find 
find Brigham Pond laid out on a map when it no longer exists is, is kind of fun. So what we learn from these things is just amazing. Uh, the next slide is, is in Abington, and it is centered around Island Grove Pond. Um, Island Grove Pond, like most of the ponds in, in the three towns, uh, is man-made. They're all mill ponds. If you pulled out the, the boards in the dam, they'd just be meadows um, and, with a river flowing through the middle of it. In this case, the Shumatuska can. But what I like about this one is in 1903, in fact, up until 1967-ish, um, the Sandy Bottom swimming hole uh, at Island Grove did not exist. It was, it was just a, a cove. And as a result, there's a, the section that has the old stone bandstand on it and the abolitionist stone um, appeared from the dam on Center Ave to be an island which is how Island Grove got its name. It was a grove of trees on an island, or so it appeared. It was actually a peninsula. But we see that on here. We see the railroad line. What I learned from this one from the first time, I hadn't looked at it, there, I knew there was a trolley line going down Par Park Ave, but it actually changed sides of the road right at the entrance to Island Grove. It went from the uh, west side of Park Ave to the east side of Park Ave. Uh, and it shows in Island Grove Park, uh, the old burial grounds. Uh, Island Grove was in part a cemetery. Um, and the fun story that goes along with it is they moved the headstones to Mount Vernon, but that's all they moved. So, um, hauntings, anyone? <laughs> I've never heard the story, but I often wonder. Um, and the next slide, I, I, as I was going through the book, I thought, boy, they slighted Rockland's, because it's kind of an alphabetical order, and Rockland's a little tiny map. Um, Rockland's three maps, but nonetheless, this was just, I don't know, put in there as a placeholder and, and showing the whole town all in one page. Uh, you don't learn much from it, but it's kind of a key to everything else that's going on. Um, and the next slide having to do with it is from the, one of the Rockland maps. And I present it for a very specific reason because it ties into something else that John Burroughs gave us. And it is, uh, we see uh, running horizontal on the page, the Hanover Branch Railroad. So that was something that, that you know, we saw otherwise on, on the, the map of the uh, railroad lines. But prominently featured in the middle of this image is the Washington Reed Estate. And you can see dotted lines for a big driveway, and it's right off of Union Street. Location-wise, well, you see Goddard Ave there. Goddard Ave is the entrance from Union Street down to the, the uh, school, down to the high school. And this location was about where Rockland Town Hall is. Um, and it was a, a big estate, and it was heavily photographed back in the day which takes me to my next, see this is a clever segue here, I hope you appreciate it. Uh, this takes me into the fact that Mr. Burroughs also gave us postcards. And there are three that I'm, I'm featuring that all have to do with the J.W. Spence estate. That was the later owner, although in 1903 it was called the Washington Reed estate, Reed sold it to Spence, another shoe manufacturer. And there are three images here. I don't know if Paul will keep them on the screen as one or whether he'll feature them individually. But the first one is this beautiful tree-lined driveway from the side down to the mansion. The next one is looking through the trees down that long, long driveway. And up at Union Street, there were you know, a big granite block wall and gates and everything everything else about where the plaza exists right now in front of the Rockland police station and then but the third one is the telling one it's looking down through the trees looking down the driveway and the mansion is gone totally gone obliterated but off to the right hand side um, and it's looking they call it Goddard Ave in this eh, it technically isn't it's still the old driveway uh, but off to the side you can make out a new building in the background that new building was at the time the new Rockland High School. And all of that complex became a municipal complex for Rockland. It became the, the town hall and all the schools you access down that road. And it's that former property documented in these postcards. The next postcard I did as kind of a singleton here is 
that school that you see off to the side, uh, labeled Rockland High School, Rockland Mass. This building it no longer exists. They tore it down in order to do the most recent school expansions at Rockland High School. And um, this building was designed by, uh, was it J.W.? J. J. Williams Beale was the architect. He also designed Dyer Memorial Library. He also designed, oh God, what else? Uh, Abington Mutual Fire Insurance. He also designed Castle in the Clouds in Moultonboro, New Hampshire. He got around. Oh, and I'm sorry, the bridge at Island Grove. So unfortunately, we lost that Beale building, but nonetheless, we have plenty of pictures of it. And I, I understand through some Rockland historians that some entry pieces to the school were preserved and, and built in somewhere to do with the new school. I haven't seen it. I don't know. Uh, and the last images that were in the postcard collection from John Burroughs were actually pictures of their house from the, 19, it says 1940 on these black and white photographs, but they were postcard size. And there are three images. Uh, this is right on Union Street. The house still looks like this. It's not terribly hard to recognize. The Union Street side is the first one. Then we come around the corner to the Exchange Street side. And the third one is kind of fun because the house used to have a barn. No longer exists, but it existed in the 1940s. And we see it here in the view on the Exchange Street side. So that kind of caps out what we got from uh, John Burroughs. There's more. I mean, there's, I, there's a whole collection of stuff. But uh, these are the pieces that I wanted to feature today. Because if you have a general interest in Rockland or in maps, I mean, these maps are cool because uh, they actually listed who owned the property, to the best of their knowledge. It would, it would say whose house it was on the map or what the building was or what the business was. So that's kind of a, a good research tool. So between the one that exists in the Dyer Collection and the one that we're adding into the Historical Society of Old Abington Collection, we have the resources. It's fun. And the last thing I want to talk about today, um, I believe, I think, is it? Yes. Um, things come to us from the strangest places. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to own a home on the island of Martha's Vineyard in the town of Oak Bluffs. And I had someone on island reach out to me, Sue Mead. And she said, uh, Doug, I have a bunch of Abington stuff. I know you're involved in Abington history. Would you like it? Well, sure, fine. And I met with her two weeks ago, and she gave me a packet of papers. And they're the sort of papers that would stay in a family, that would get passed down through a family. Um, so they're interesting genealogical-wise, but in this case, it's also important to know who the family was. It was the Brett family, and um, they had a business. They co-owned a business, um, and it was Burbick and Brett. And they were in North Abington near the train station. They also had holdings over on Monroe, Monroe Street near, near the uh, uh, Hanover Branch rail line. But they dealt in hay and grain and other, other things, other goods. And they were a prominent family in town. So we have from them, we have deeds, we have business papers about the business being transferred, we have how they acquired the business. Uh, all of these add to our knowledge of how business was done in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. But in addition to the deeds and the business paperwork, there were other significant documents that the family thought important. And one of the first is, again, I have provided Paul with a slide for it. It's, it's tiny, which is, you know, you want to see this one bigger. <laughs> so uh, Paul will be able to do that. And I put the inside and the outside of the booklet on the same page. But the family was very active in the North Abington Congregational Church, originally called the Fourth Congregational Church. Um, Center Abington was the mother church, the first congregational church. Uh, Whitman uh, was the first breakaway. That was the second congregational church. Rockland was the, the other ward of town, East Abington. And they were the third congregational church. We had a lot of congregationalists. And then North Abington was the fourth and final daughter church, as we sometimes call it. Uh, you probably know the building now because it also served as town hall 
and library from the early, in the late 1960s up until we built the new town hall and library in Abington. And I had the distinct honor of taking this building for clients of mine and converting it into, I think it was 17 apartments. Um, and so the building still stands. But the Brett family, as we can tell from this document, was, was very prominent in the church. Uh, they list the committees on the inside. And when you look at the pulpit supply committee, the first name is Mr. W.C. Brett. Okay, the Brett family. Missionary committee, Mrs. W.C. Brett. Um, lookout committee, I have no idea what that is. But Mr. W.C. Brett was on it. And visitation of the sick committee, both Mr. and Mrs. Brett were on it. So they were clearly very active in the church. But uh, the back part gives the financial statement from 1911 to 1912. Uh, and as I said, like the list of all the officers, the, the minister at the time. Uh, it's a quick little information packet that you, you know, might want to, might be available to you as you came in the church as a visitor, as a new member, uh, knowing who, who was who. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, I have not seen this piece before. It was a delightful insight into the history of the church at that time. Uh, so, again, something they would save. They were active in the church. Um, another piece that we have two copies of here is a um, concert program. And uh, I have the slide here. Uh, here's an actual copy. They're, they're a little tattered and worn and falling apart, and one of them has notes on the back, the other does not. But clearly they were very proud because Alden Brett was uh, in, in one of the musical numbers that night. This was June 20th of 1898, at 8 o'clock in the evening at the Congregational Church in North Abington. Um, male chorus of 30 voices, drum chorus, 12 pieces, doors open at 7.30, and the tickets were on sale at F.W. Clark's clothing store. So um, it was a big deal, and they proudly saved it because their son was, uh, was participating in it, and it was their church, so it was important. Now, Sue, who gave this to me, um, Mr. Brett, as in Burbeck and Brett, was her great I believe great great grandfather and she and her sister are still around and uh, I've known Sue on island for years uh, but so she reached out and, and this is what happens so and we naturally encourage that if you have something of historic significance in Abington we want to know about it and if we can get our hands on it we definitely want to know about it um, the last piece I want to end with today, I have a little postscript here to talk about donations and everything in general, but um, included in, in the Brett package was a tax bill from 1890. The Abington tax rate, hold on to your hats folks, in 1890 was $19.40 per thousand. Today's tax rate is $16.48 per thousand. So. They paid a lot more per thousand than we do for all of those who are griping about your taxes. But of course the game is, it's not the tax rate, it's the assessment that tells what you're really paying for your real estate taxes. But I, I just chuckled when I read it thinking, that's pretty high by today's standards. So anyway, so this is a taste of the sort of things that come through our door. What's changed is the internet has changed. It gives us access to faraway places, to items that we would be beyond our reach. Um, the way we acquire pieces, the way we pay for pieces, again, we don't have an acquisition budget. But if something is important enough and we want it and it's been offered to us and money is involved, we will reach out. We will reach out and look for sponsors and say, hey, you know, And if that's something that you folks are interested in doing, um, if something important comes up and you want to let it be known that you would be willing to sponsor a piece, we'd like to know about that. It gives us a better sense of the sort of things we can go after. Um, just last week, there was a piece coming up for auction, and one of my, one of my um, guys out there who follows auctions and is very involved in them said, Doug, there's a Civil War piece from Whitman coming up, and um, we can't acquire it otherwise. It's going through the auction. Uh, do you want me to bid on it? I kind of gritted my teeth and said, uh, okay. 
And the piece was uh, a, like a diorama set up, a, a shadow box of, uh, I think it was the gentleman's, the soldier from a civil war. Uh, it was like his, I don't know, drumming out papers, his enlistment papers or what, his last piece of hard tack and his knife and his fork, all framed nicely in this amazing presentation piece. And of course, what we represent Abington, Rockland, and Whitman, yeah, I want to own the piece. Uh, the collection wants to own the piece more specifically. So he called me, actually texted me that night and said, well, we didn't get it. I, I, I bid up to $850. What? <laughs> I don't have $850. Anyway, uh, uh, we probably made it more expensive for the guy who won it, but I think it went for $900. That's way beyond our budget and way beyond what we'd expect to spend. What I hope to do through the course of that transaction is find out who won it. I think I can find out. And again, like, like the Sam Brown piece, let's get pictures of it. Let's, let's have some record of it in our collection. Uh, let's know who owns it. Let's know where it goes. And let's express our interest. Hey, you ever want to leave it to anyone? Leave it to us. So anyway, um, I hope I've if not just shown you some of what we have and the nature of what we have and the things you can find here, but also our interest in expanding our collections and the broader based ways we can do it. We don't necessarily need to have the piece, knowing about the piece, having photo records of the piece, knowing where it is. Sometimes that's enough for researchers, for researchers to know that sort of stuff. That's very valuable. So um, we look at things differently now. We, we adapt and um, we hope you we hope you join us in doing that. We also hope you join us as members of the Historical Society, and we're going to start soon planting, uh, planning, planning our programs, our conversations for next year. We welcome your input as to the sort of things you might like to see us talk about, the sort of people you might like to see us talk to, um, the subjects, the whatever. Um, we want to present things that catch your interest, so by all means, reach out to us. Uh, I think that's it for today. I thank Paul Watson for uh, being, excuse me, being here today for, for the taping. And I don't envy him his task of now assembling this into a program using all the images I provided him with. Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, on local cable and on YouTube. Thank you to our donors. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to you at home. And I'll sign off now. I'm Doug Ulwick, the president of the Historical Society of Old Abington. And I've enjoyed coming into your home today. Thank you.